officer associations training uh, called using economic data and trends to better understand the economic landscape. My name is G Jay Kowalski. I'm a consultant with GFOA. This webinar is approximately one hour in length and is worth one continuing professional education credit based on a 15 minute hour. All participants connections have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can submit them using the Q&A feature in the pane on the right side of your screen. Staff members from GFOA's Technical Services Center are standing by to reply. At the conclusion of the event, we'll be redirected to a short survey to evaluate the content of today's presentation. CPE certificates will be emailed to all paid participants in approximately two weeks. Our speakers for today's session are Matt Millar, Chief Consultant with Regenerate LLC, Ruth McToon of the City of Seattle, where he's a City Finance Director, and finally, Nancy Zilke, Senior Director of Alvarez and Mark Public Ser Sector Services, LLC. Looking forward to today's session, what we have on the agenda. Uh, I'll be doing a review of the Economic Indicators Dashboard that we've recently launched. Matt Millar will look into uh, the COVID-19 forecasts that he's prepared and discuss those. Rick with the Chicago Fed will explore possible paths forward for state and local government. And Glenn will discuss how Seattle uses economic data to forecast revenues, et cetera. Finally, before Nancy Zilke will uh, speak about her work as uh, in the consulting role, working with local governments as well as you know, her decades of experience working directly in local government that has explored her current work around navigating financial difficulty and change. So about a month ago, GFOA created a number of dashboards to provide one location for local government finance officers to easily access an up-to-date array of data, trends, indices to help them uh, understand the financial landscape and aid in their budget uh, process. So the first uh, dashboard I've chosen to look at here is everyone is thinking about is, you know, what's going to happen to revenue and what am I dependent on? And so these are aggregate numbers of the local property tax revenue, sales tax revenue, local utility tax revenue, and local income tax revenue by state. So the heat map, the underlying shows what percentage of general revenue comes from, in this map's case in the lower left, from the from local income tax, so you can see a strong band uh, from uh, Kentucky all the way up to New York, whereas uh, some of the property tax states in the upper right um, often correspond to having lower uh, sales tax, and so they make up a lot of it there. Um, the entertainment desert southwest heavily relies on sales tax, as does Louisiana and New Orleans, and then finally. Um, Nebraska and Tennessee stand out as um, heavily utilizing utility revenue. But understanding revenue sources is going to be more crucial than ever as finance officers have uh, deal with unprecedented times in many of our career, in most of our careers. Um, looking for the unemployment, underemployment, and poverty rates. As we can see, the economy and employment was humming along very nicely until COVID hit, and then suddenly you know, we have an underemployment rate, which also counts other disaffected workers of 22.8% currently, and then an unemployment that's shot up from historic lows around 5% to about 15% now. The weekly unemployment claims have leveled off, uh, however, they are still staggering, even when compared to the little blip that we see on the map following the Great Recession. Stock market volatility, quite comparable actually to what we saw around the Great Recession. Um, large spikes, that's the, what they call the fear index, um, is investors' comfort, uncertainty, and in investment. And then finally, the interest rate spread between 10 year treasury notes and two year notes, um, also something to to watch for and um, it is much more helpful when thinking about long-term forecasting with debt issuance and um, those kind of items. Finally, we can also look at building permits which have dropped off quite precipitously. Um, there's, there's a lot of the uh, construction and 
things that would normally be occurring in these uncertain times has probably been put on hold is, is probably the case in many of your own experience in your own municipalities. And finally, another um, interesting indicator that is useful to look into is the revolving consumer credit owned and securitized, also known as the, the credit card debt outstanding. So as we can see, the steadily rising strong economy and it started to come off a little bit of a slope. And uh, you know, consumers are fearful of the future, uh, incomes are uncertain, um, financials are tightening. And so that's gonna impact things like your sales tax. Um, and, and with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Millar, who is gonna talk about some of the COVID-19 forecasting they've been doing. Take it away, Matt. Hey. Thanks everyone for being here. I'm honored to be able to talk to you and be given the gift of your time. I would take uh, what Jake said and actually uh, make it a little bit stronger that I imagine many of you have chosen to be here today because you're facing an amount of uncertainty uh, in economic forecasting and, and budget revenues in particular that's really unprecedented in our lifetimes. And much of that uncertainty stems from COVID-19. Uh, I've been at the forefront of COVID pro projections since the beginning. What you're looking at uh, since the beginning of the year, what you're looking at here is my prediction of accumulated deaths in the US attributed to COVID. The dotted lines there are 90% confidence interval. So we were 90% confident that it would fall between the dotted gray lines in April when we made that 30 day forecast and the dotted black lines in May when we made that forecast. Um, as you can see that the actual, the yellow line is well within the range and pretty close to my best estimate. Um, these predictions are on the GFOA dashboard and a new 30 day update will be coming up next week. Uh, just as a quick background for myself, I've been in finance and management consulting for almost 20 years. And for the last eight years, I've been focused on helping companies make crucial investment decisions when they've been confronted with something they perceive as immeasurable. So that's, a, that's my skill set. Uh, as I said, I've been at or near the top of the pack in terms of accuracy and narrowness of ranges uh, since I started making projections in January. And this is just a little graphic comparing um, our, projection, our projections in April with a few of the other major models out there. So these are available. Uh, there's a GitHub repository for it, and, and 538 publishes it. Um, and you can see that, for example, in the uh, compared to the University of Texas, we're right down the middle. The ranges are similar in narrowness, um, but uh, the actuals were above the University of Texas projections. The IHME projections were wider than ours, and again, Columbia, similar narrowness, but it was at the bottom of their range and, and right down the middle for ours. Um, one of the things I want to mention is uh, one of the first projections I made was infections in Wuhan in late January. Uh, and those numbers weren't realized or weren't re really reported in the academic literature until nearly two months later. And I mentioned this early prediction because at that point, you can think back to late January or early February, there weren't too many people who were willing to stake their reputation on any sort of projection simply because the level of uncertainty was so high. And I think that's relevant to today's webinar specifically because we are at an analogous point with respect to the economy and public finances. And a good evidence for that is, is just the existence of this webinar uh, and your attendance. So, okay, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this, this is just another um, shot from the, from the website. Uh, main point I want to make here is that there are quirks in reporting, even things like daily deaths. You can see there's a weekly pattern. So these quirks make interpretation of data fraught with peril, and I would say especially confirmed cases. So. Currently, there's a talk of resurgence in the U.S. That's probably a little premature. Taken at a national level, the evidence is that we're still seeing a steady decline in disease, um, with the caveat that there are uh, warning signs in some states. So let's just take a look. Um, we're here today to talk about economic activity, and I think uh, what everyone's most, most concerned about is uh, impacts on tax revenue. Um, and, and other issues facing, you know, local and uh, state and municipalities. 
And whenever we're facing a problem of great uncertainty, we want to use the tools that are appropriate for that situation. Uh, again, I mentioned um, the accuracy of, of, of my models with respect to COVID, but really I credit that to the probabilistic approach thought by Doug Hubbard. And that's uh, mainly who I've been working with and for for these last eight years. I don't have time to fully address this method, but I'll just mention that we approach things using probabilistic models. We take a Bayesian approach. And in addition to the data and academic research, we're always open and we almost always use calibrated estimates from human subject matter experts to create our models. So that's a little bit about the how. As far as a six month forecast, the first thing I'll say is that there is much more uncertainty in a six month forecast than there is in a one month forecast. And I'm getting used to saying that there are very wide error bars. And I think that's, I think that's true. I think you'll probably hear that from all the panelists today, that the error bars are, are much wider than what, what we would normally uh, expect or predict. And that's maybe the most salient uh, point about this, this whole situation that we're in, is really we just have to accept that there's a great deal more uncertainty. Speaking, speaking specifically to the COVID path, though, in terms of what I foresee, the best estimate is um, I continue to be fairly optimistic. So you can see my best estimate line there finishes December 15th below 200,000 in terms of total deaths. Um, the dotted line on the, um, the upper dotted line is um, the 95th percentile. So there's a 5% chance that it would be that bad or worse. The main risk that I see is actually schools reopening. So the resumption of public schools, is it, if it were to occur in September, uh, is the main risk. And that's because um, we've seen a lot of success stories like South Korea, Taiwan, New Zealand. You've heard those. But every time, even a place like South Korea, every time a location has tried to open up public schools, there has been a spike in infections. So if I had to point to one thing that I was most concerned about, it would be resumption of schools um, if it happens in September. If it doesn't happen, we need to figure out what that looks like because there's a lot of parents, me being one of them, uh, who have <laughs> uh, three kids um, you know, in public school and uh, obviously that, that impacts families and the ability to uh, be productive. So that's, that's, a, uh, that, that's a big, uh, I would say almost bad news out there. In terms of good news, I would say the what we've seen recently in terms of evidence of outdoor transmission has been very encouraging. There was a legitimate concern that the various um, mass gatherings could start another wave of infections. And this has not been observed at this point. Uh, this is showing the Twin Cities um, confirmed. This is the county, the two uh, urban counties in the Twin Cities uh, combined. And you can see that starting in late May, the, uh, the number of confirmed cases started on a downward trend. That was also at the same time, the start of, I call it outdoor lack of social distancing. You know, that's mass gatherings, however you want to call that. Um, but you would expect that roughly 11 days later, you would start, if there was an adverse effect on infections, you should start observing that about 11 days later in the confirmed cases data. And we do not. You can see the actual is closest to the low slash no impact line, which would just be a continuation of the previous two weeks um, reduction in confirmed COVID cases. So that's really good news. Uh, now it's possible that it just hasn't shown up in the data yet, but it's unlikely at this point that there was a significant bump in the disease transmission from this. So that's really good news. That has really good implications. All right, and then my last slide for today is just kind of some conclusions. We've got a good news. The outdoor transmission is relatively rare. We've known that. Uh, for quite some time, but uh, you know, I think this, the latest evidence from the mass gatherings points to that strongly. Uh, the other good news is, um, our, well, at least our best estimate, HDR best estimate, has the rate of new cases and deaths declining throughout the summer. Uh, the bad news would be that attempts to restart schools in different countries and regions have so far been associated with spikes in infections. I call the evidence that reopening is creating a second wave as inconclusive, I call that the ugly news, simply because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of uh, 
opacity, uh, ins and outs in terms of interpreting COVID statistics. And in particular, um, increases in confirmed cases is not always a reliable metric. And then the final thing I want to point out is this, uh, before I hand it over to Rick, is this uh, article that came out recently. Uh, the, the, uh, the link is there in the bottom. And that talks about structural effects and uh, what expected infection fatality rates are across the entire world. And I think this is a really important key distinction in our debate as we debate um, what works and what doesn't work in terms of reopening the economy. Um, when comparing deaths per million across different regions, if we're doing apples to apples comparisons and we're saying what does different degrees of lockdown, how does that really influence um, outcomes? Much of the difference is, is actually explained by structural effects. So things like age, which obviously is the largest determinant of outcome, uh, but even things like population density, poverty statistics, and health statistics, they explain at least as much as non-pharmaceutical interventions in terms of a, you know, a statistical regression trying to predict uh, deaths per million across different regions on an apples-to-apples -apples basis. So that's, uh, that's the last point I'll, make you, I'll, I'll leave you with. I think that's a, a very interesting study if you're, if you're wanting to look into that more deeply. And now I will pass it off to Rick Mattoon, Senior Economist with the Chicago Federal Reserve, for the next section of today's webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I really appreciate that. And thanks to GFOA for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, one of the things I have to do as um, my standard, if anybody's ever seen a Fed economist present, is I have to use the disclaimer we always have to give, which is what I'm about to say is my opinion, not necessarily that of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago or the Federal Reserve System. Um, so I want to start and motivate my talk by asking the basic question, which is can you forecast in the current environment? And I think this really builds off of Matt's comments, which I thought were really spot on, which is the answer is probably not. Um, this frankly, just too much level of uncertainty and too much of a ability to sort of get things wrong that make forecasting right now extremely problematic, at least in the, even in the short run. You know, if you look at current data, it's really not very helpful at this point. Um, if you put it into most models at this point, because it's so extreme, it tends to make the models behave very, very poorly. Um, so that's really hard. If you try to use prior recessions as kind of a template for figuring out what you think the projected recovery will be for the U.S. Um, that doesn't tend to work very well. People have tried using the Great Recession as kind of a template. Others have suggested that this is kind of like a natural disaster, and that doesn't seem to exactly fit. So it's truly a unique circumstance that we're facing, and that makes things really difficult. You know, as many people have said, this is truly one of those black swan events. Um, it really couldn't have been predicted um, very well, and, you know, it sort of is unique in and of itself. So you have to sort of view this on its own terms, not necessarily relying much on history. Um, I do like to always use this one particular quote from Eisenhower as sort of a defense for why you should continue to try to do forecasting, because he was the one who said, in preparing for battle, although I've always found that plans um, um, aren't helpful, um, but planning is indispensable. So I think that's something that we can all learn from. So if you look at the, the next slide, for some reason, won't advance. Um, if you look at the next slide. Um, uh, Rick, I might have to highlight, if you go over on the left side of the screen. Oh. Uh, actually, I, I can do it for you. I'll just do okay. it. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, so if you go to the next next slide, um, this just shows you, this is just a whole sort of series of forecasts that are currently out there. And what I wanna emphasize through this is simply that there's really no consensus on sort of where the economy is headed. So what this shows you, and unfortunately the headings got cut off, were a number of nine prominent private forecasters predicting where they thought GDP was going to land. And so the first column was supposed to be first quarter of 2020, second column, second, uh, second quarter of 2020, third is third quarter, and the uh, fourth column is fourth quarter. As you can see, if you look at these projections, they're all over the place, and they're basically based on what scenario you have for how the health effects of COVID are going to play out. So you have everything from, you know, a most positive projection of suggesting that after a very sharp 
downturn in the second quarter, which is the middle one of 24.5%, you have a fairly rapid snapback in economic activity. This is more close to kind of a V-shaped recovery. The median projection is more along the lines of kind of like this check-shaped or Nike swoosh-shaped re recovery, where you definitely get back to better levels by the end of the year. But it's again, it's a long haul to get there, and you still won't be back to where you were at the beginning of the year at the end of 2021. And if you look at the worst case scenario, I think this one is really based on an assumption that you have some sort of a second wave of COVID or there's not, you know, you have some sort of real restrictions in returning to any sort of level of sort of normal economic activity. And that suggests we'll be close to sort of having a recovery even by the end of the year with very sluggish growth even into the fourth quarter. So if you look at the next slide, this is going to show you what the Federal Reserve came out with. So last week we had an FOMC meeting, and I just wanted to highlight here, and these are annual numbers. So the 6.5% decline in real GDP for, uh, is for the entire year of 2020. And then you can see we project at this point sort of a softer recovery, a 5% recovery rate, you know, fairly strong growth in 2021 and fading off a little bit to 3.5% in 2022. Um, and, but as you can see, if you look at the ranges underneath, again, the ranges are really pretty wide open. So you have ev everywhere from a 10% decline to a minus 4.2% decline projected for this year. And you have some thinking there'll be faster recovery, some with slower recovery. If you look at unemployment, you can see the same sort of gap in terms of where the forecast is. Um, the one thing that there is more consensus on is that inflation is not really going to be an issue for some time to come. As you can see, the outlook is very sanguine all the way through 2022, with um, it not even reaching most of the time a projection of the 2% level we'd like to see it at. And if you look at one thing that there seems to be great certainty about is the Fed funds rate, which is an expectation that it's not going to move at all all the way through 2022, that will be anchored pretty much at the 0 to 0.25% rate we are right now. So if you look at the next slide, um, I think the fundamental question that a lot of economists has approached this is, is this a liquidity event for firms and for governments or is it a solvency event? Um, I think the initial impulse was this was more of a liquidity issue, that what you were going to see was sort of cash flow problems really um, hurting um, governments, firms. But essentially, once economic activity recovered, you'd have a fairly strong recovery, and they'd recover some of that loss demand that occurred over this period of time. I think what's evolved now is the thought that it's both, um, that some of this lost demand isn't going to come back. And so for many businesses and many governments, that suggests that this is also a solvency event. It's not just the lost cash over this period of time. It's the fact that some of this business may never come back, um, and that will have significant impact on sort of the shape of the recovery going forward. So all this is predicated on having to have some idea of how you think consumers will react to yet another new normal. So at this point, I think we have our first question that we we're going to ask, which is a poll question. So I'm interested in thinking from where you sit, when do you think tax returns are going to return to pre-COVID levels? Um, so I've given you five possible answers from fairly certain, fairly soon to the end of 2021, to the end of 2022, to sometime after 2022. Um, so I'll be very interested in seeing your response to see how people think um, their revenue situation is going to look and how quick they think they're going to see a recovery of, of revenues to where they were prior to the COVID crisis. Okay, so uh, we can go on to the next slide. Um, so I think one of the things that I have learned through long and hard um, experience in the profession is that um, the Great Recession really taught economists a lot, particularly when it came to doing economic modeling. And one of the things that emerged from the Great Recession was this notion that maybe behavioral econom economics really has a lot to tell us in terms of how to think about how economies respond to downturns. So coming out of the Great Recession, almost all sort of standard economic theory suggested that if you had an economy where you had super low interest rates, which we had, fairly strong federal stimulus, the consumers would feel 
feel pretty confident that they not only spend, but given these very low interest rates, they take on debt. And the same thing would happen for firms. So you'd have this very sharp recovery. However, behavioral economists pretty well saw this wasn't going to be the case. What they suggested that people's risk appetite had essentially diminished. The fear was a bigger and bigger issue that was facing them. And for this reason, what you saw was people actually did the opposite of what traditional economic models would have predicted. They deleveraged, firms deleveraged, and they increased savings. Um, having reserves all of a sudden became much more valuable than pushing the limits of growth through leverage. And so behavioral economists sort of picked this up. Um, traditional sort of macroeconomic, uh, rational behavior economists didn't really get this in terms of their um, conditions. So that really leads me to my next point, which is this is really a time for humility. Um, so I think one of the things that Matt pointed out is having this kind of probabilistic kind of scenario really is the best way to think about this, which is you can come up with a best case example, an intermediate case, and a least good case, and all of these are going to be driven by your assumptions as to how do you think COVID will play out. So, you know, in the you know, sort of best case, there's an effective vaccine or herd immunity. You know, essentially everybody gets to go back to their pre-COVID lifestyle. So you get maybe a V-shaped recovery because there's some certainty that the virus has actually been extinguished. In the intermediate case, which is kind of maybe what we're in right now, there's development of a maybe an effective treatment protocol, um, there's through social contact, um, becomes less risky, but you have some limited limits to economic activity. And the least case is that neither a vaccine nor an effective treatment protocol is developed, and we have a significant second wave. Um, in the Spanish flu in case, the case the second wave was actually far more deadly than the first wave, and so you would go back into shutdown. Um, so essentially, you would draw out sort of forecasts based on those sort of three different case uh, cases. So if you go to the next slide, this just shows you again what happens when you have an uncertain future. And so what you can see right now is from February to March, Americans start savings at an extraordinary level. The personal savings rate went above 13%, which as you can see is extraordinarily high even by any sort of historical standards. So people stop buying stuff, you saw the decline in retail sales and they start saving. And they start saving because they're fearful about what the future is going to look like. Um, next slide. Um, so the big unanswerable question is, does all of this, does COVID lead to structural change going forward? And so some have argued what COVID is doing mostly is simply pulling forward trends that were already underway in the economy. So some of this is it's less structural change than change that maybe was already occurring and maybe now we're just catching up with the dimensions of what that was going to look like. So, you know, some things that come to mind obviously are an increase in demand for online products, application-based purchase of goods and services. That seems fairly obvious. That's been going on for some time, but obviously been, it's been heightened through this particular time. Greater acceptance of telecommuting and working from home. Again, the idea that people may not actually go back to the office after all this is done. And then a decline, obviously, in brick and mortar retailing, suggesting that a lot of the retail spaces out there is never fully going to be occupied again and could be a considerable drag on recovery. And then even in education, more telelearning that simply will become more acceptable to do um, more and more education online rather than necessarily in person. So next slide. Um, so what are the implications of these changes? Well, the first is there's a particular challenge, I think, to large metros and specifically dense downtowns. If part of this is the notion that you don't necessarily want to pack people into tighter locations and have as a key part of their work you know, close personal interactions, that's been the model that really has spurred large uh, metropolitan growth over the last two decades. It's been this densification of downtowns, the concentration of jobs in central business districts that have really allowed metros to really do very well. Obviously, if this reverses itself and all of a sudden you want to spread out your workforce, it's kind of a significant influence on demand for commercial office space. Um, you know, it's possible that you're never fully going to lease out all the dense downtown space. There could be more demand than for more remote space where there's less 
surface density could change sort of the geography of where work takes place. Another is obviously a redesign of existing office architecture. You know, prior to this, you know, co-office sharing, we work um, space was all the rage. Now the idea that again, this is based on a model where you have people working in very dense locations, you know, that may not be attractive or even feasible at all, that you may need to have social distancing even within any office and that will change dramatically sort of how you um, conduct work in offices. Um, death of malls and strip centers, um, again, you're seeing this occurring because, again, for malls, there's less and less attraction to necessarily having lots of people in one place shopping. In addition, large um, retailers have been particularly exposed, and as they become more and more vacant space within large malls, that's going to be an issue that's going to you know, drive a lot of retail development going forward. Again, suburbs may become more attractive. I mean, anecdotally, they say one of the things that's happening outside New York City is, um, you know, housing prices in the suburbs in New Jersey and Connecticut have gone up significantly as people from New York are now buying suburban houses rather than living in the city. So it changed in terms of where people want to live in these terms of ways. And then the last issue is this notion of creating a resilience economy. And this is the idea that you're going to have to build more cushion into almost everything going forward. So it suggests you're going to want larger cash reserves, you know, larger carry, larger amounts of inventory. Things in the past would have seemed inefficient are now going to be things that you probably are going to want to do. So the last thing I want to leave you with is just some thoughts about what it is, you know, from my point of view, I think states and localities really need to take advantage of right now. And, that, and that's to try to force a rethink of the issue of fiscal federalism. Um, one of the things that economists noted, particularly coming out of the Great Recession, is that because the federal government's relief wasn't um, all that complete, um, states and localities were forced to make a number of budget cuts, many of which um, weren't necessarily the best in terms of um, you know, promoting future economic growth. Um, in particular, cuts were concentrated on things like higher education, infrastructure, public aid, even K through 12 education. And if you think of these as really essential services that, that state and local governments provide, there's a national interest in making sure that they have the resources to continue to provide these essential services, regardless of the business cycle, and particularly when a downturn has nothing to do with their own behavior. So what you want to do is isolate isolate exactly what is the structural part of, the, of a downturn versus what's the cyclical part. And I would argue that the federal government has a strong role in making sure that the cyclical part of the downturn is compensated for. So many, many economists have argued for some time that um, the federal government should really look into creating a system of automatic stabilizers that are triggered by specific in economic indicators. And this is something I think, again, local governments and state governments can sort of push for. I think that would be something to be quite useful going forward. Um, so thanks for your time and attention. I, I think we're going to turn it over to our friend in Seattle, and he's going to talk to you about what uh, real governments do as opposed to what I do. So thanks very much. Thank you very much. Um, boy, there's some uh, big issues there that you covered. Um, I wanted to share with folks kind of the main things that, that we're focusing on dealing with our very severe uh, downtown uh, downturn and, um, and also the events that have occurred in the last two to three weeks. We're really focused on four main issues. Uh, understanding the expectations and the conditions of the local economy. We're constantly worried about our cash position, although it's robust. We, we want to make sure that we see trends coming of uh, exhausting some of our balances. Uh, we're looking at systemic adjustments to how we spend money. Um, and then we're also looking at uh, core change changes to our core programs uh, that would result in permanent ongoing reductions of services. And of course, that takes a bit of a different meaning now than it did a month ago. Um, I, I'd say a fifth area is our council and mayor are now very actively looking at uh, adding additional taxes. And over the last 24 hours, I've been heavily engaged in that, but we'll put that off um, for another time. So 
when we do our forecasting of our major revenue streams, we um, really are looking at three different things. We um, look at several different national economic forecasts, uh, in particular estimates of employment levels and income. Uh, we find that we can explain the movement of our revenues, about 50% of that, of the movement of our revenues uh, by just the national forecasts. Um, second is that we look very, very closely at regional economic, uh, I'm sorry, uh, employment and income data and model those ourselves based on national trends. Uh, we use primarily the data that uh, we can receive from the state agency that administers workers' comp and unemployment insurance taxes. That's the most comprehensive data we have on employment. Uh, those data are generally, the, the most up-to-date data are generally regional, but we find that we have a very high correlation of our revenues to our regional economic activity. In addition, we add to the uh, state data um, public announcements and some private information we have of our three large employers regionally, that would be Amazon, Microsoft, and Boeing. Uh, we actually do forecast for Boeing employment based upon their public information on their orders, um, which is not looking good right now, as you can imagine. And, um, and so we, we actually do uh, statistical analyses and forecasts of, of their uh, activity and then can link that then to our revenues, thinking that uh, for every dollar that an uh, employee earns at one of these firms, uh, you know, 80 cents of it, 75 cents is, is uh, spent locally that on taxable activities. Finally, we look at uh, our sales tax data very carefully by sector uh, we have that uh, data available uh, each month, and uh, it also, from our perspective, is a leading indicator of what's happening in our economy. Uh, normally, we link all these together with a series of econometric models. As the prior um, individuals have described, those models are not uh, as reliable right now because the nature of the changes in all these data are larger than, than what would be reasonably uh, assumed in the parameters could handle or the structure of the models can handle. Uh, so uh, what basically what has been working for us is now up in the air, of course, um, as has been described. Um, what's stunning to us is the speed of all these changes. And so uh, what seemed like pretty real data that we'd get or up-to-date real-time data that we'd get, it may be a month or two de delayed now seems like an eternity, and we're just now getting live data for what happened in April. And as the prior speaker uh, described, um, the first month is not probably, the, the initial weeks of the pandemic are probably not the basis of changing all your forecasts for. So um, that this is such a fast moving event that it's making it very difficult for us to uh, have confidence in our normal modeling. So what are we left with? We're spending a lot of time looking at different scenarios of, of economic activity, both of our three big players, as well as the rest of the region, and then at least three different scenarios uh, about national economic activity, including not only levels of employment and income, but also um, um, the timing of, of when those things uh, will develop. So uh, our, our third question is uh, for you. I'd be interested in seeing uh, what kind of econometric forecasting do you use to estimate your revenues? Um, and right now, we clearly, as I just described, are in the sometimes camp. We used to rely very heavily on our analyses, but um, I think uh, for logical reasons, we're, we're doing a lot of judgmental estimating right now. Okay, I then we'll move into the second area and I'll go through these very quickly. Um, as all of you do, we look very closely at our uh, cash inflows and outflows. Uh, we normally forecast weekly um, and, and now our challenge really is on the inflow side. Not only do, are our revenue estimates or inflow 
uh, estimates of cash inflow changing dramatically, but we ha have other problems and uh, those include uh, decisions to defer a lot of tax payments. Um, so for example, the county treasurer decided not to collect all property taxes that were due in April until July. So to the extent there's volatility in our property tax data because of this, uh, we won't see that for, for uh, weeks and it does significantly affect our cash inflow. And so we're trying to estimate what does it look like now to get the money later and how does that affect our cash position. And across the board for all our revenue streams, now our cash people are trying to estimate the implications of delinquencies. We expect delinquencies to skyrocket in, in, uh, in our utility area, as well as our corporate tax um, uh, area. We've deferred some uh, um, payment deadlines, but we still expect substantially increases, substantial increases in, in tax delinquency. So those are the things we're thinking about in the cash arena. So in terms of trying to balance all of this, we're kind of looking at uh, two camps. First, systematic adjustments. And what I mean by that are adjustments that can be made across the board despite or irregardless of the program area. We're spending a fair amount of time looking at operating budget underspend in 2018 and 2019 to try to figure out if there's just programs that we have that can't keep up with their appropriations and actually there are several. And the starting point is to reduce their budgets just across the board by an average of what they're not, um, what they're not uh, accomplished by now. That we're also looking very closely at um, uh, vacancy rates. Uh, we've implemented a hiring freeze. So we're now busy just with the tactical activity of capturing the savings that we uh, get because of hiring freeze. And in addition, looking at patterns of vacancies uh, that have occurred in 2019, um, which um, now is the time to take advantage of those patterns and see if we can systemically increase vacancy rates to match what we've seen um, in our past uh, experience. Uh, finally, of course, all of you, just like us, are looking at our capital accomplishment rates. They have gone down dramatically in the last three to four years because it's tough for us to get brick and mortar style capital activities going relative to the economy. Uh, being so hot here in Seattle with private sector development, we expect that to change. So we have to think very hard about uh, capital accomplishments rates. And in fact, we might be in a period of time where we're the only bidder for a construction service where before we were one of 40 or 50. And then finally, we're working with our labor partners to look at a variety of reductions that, uh, uh, that we may be able to have in the labor environment just beyond uh, managing uh, vacancy rates more tightly. Um, finally, we're struggling to figure out really, at, we're looking at about a 15 to 20% reduction in our operating revenues. And at that level, I've been in this business for 30 years. I've never seen anything at that level before. And I've been through, this is my fourth major recession that I've worked through. Um, we are just not equipped to determine how to set priorities for programs or set reduction targets when you have that kind of uh, reduction that we may be looking to make on a permanent basis. And so we've asked departments to tell us if you had to drop 10% out of your budget, what are your priorities of what you would let go? And therefore the other 90% is higher. We are also matching the city programs relative to the essential service delivery model that we developed under COVID, um, which effectively means amenities like libraries, parks, swimming pools and whatnot are uh, effectively at the bottom of the list in terms of priorities. And then the cabinet itself is working through several weeks of, as a group, of setting priorities in support of the mayor. And the mayor is then going to look at these different um, rankings of programs and, and then start making the tough choices about what programs to skim off a little bit as opposed to what programs to actually reduce substantially up to 30, 40%. 
just to conclude here, um, I, I, I do believe that we are in unprecedented conditions and, and our confidence intervals in our estimating ability, both in terms of expenses, but especially revenues are extremely wide. And so what we're doing is just forecasting different revenue scenarios, just different assumptions about different conditions that likely could occur both regionally and nationally, and then trying to plan to those that we think we can plan to. And I can tell you for the more severe uh, scenarios, we're not even, we just don't have the bandwidth to plan for that kind of contraction in our services. Um, and our mayor will be comfortable with that decision. The most important thing I'm worried about is, as mentioned before, and that is we are a job center. We've become very dense. We have several hundred thousand jobs in downtown Seattle. And right now, no one's coming to downtown Seattle. And we're worried to see whether firms decide not to send their workers back, not only in the short run, but in the long run. That will devastate our revenue streams uh, permanently. And so we're looking for every anecdotal bit of information we can find to understand how that trend will go forward. So uh, thank you very much for your time. I'd like to now introduce our last speaker, and that is Nancy Zalke. She's a senior director at Alvarez and Marsal Public Sector Services, a terrific consulting team that we use uh, frequently here in Seattle. Thank you, Nancy. Well, thank you, Glenn, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, you know, my mother loves always loved this picture, so um, I had to put it up there. But, you know, first of all, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here today with GFOA. Um, I have been an active member of GFOA for, for since the mid-'80s, and I really find GFOA to be a very rewarding organization in, in putting together great presentations like this, as well as the guiding principles and recommended practices. Um, you know, for I can say almost 40 years, because I have a birthday this week, so I can change the slide. Um, I've been in working in either in local government or with um, governments, improving efficiency, process improvement, and really dealing with budgets and, and, and revenue models. Um, I love what I do, and I really enjoy putting together solutions. But who would have thought? When we were sitting around all watching the Super Bowl, you know, earlier, you know, back in early February, that we would be sitting here today, you know, talking about another major economic crisis, economic, you know, problem that's facing our communities. You know, the fact that, you know, we've seen this before, we've weathered this before, but to me, just like what, you know, the previous panelists have said, COVID-19 and this economic downturn is so much different than what we've seen before. The fact that, you know, our, you know, our taxpayers, our citizens are requiring additional cash assistance. We're seeing unfunded costs, the declines in our, our tax base, the continued budget stresses, as well as, as we know, the continued um, you know, lack of interest in our municipal debt is just putting different stresses on, on our economy. Rick talked about this already, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over this, but he was absolutely right. The fact that going back to 2009, the way our state and local governments dealt with the economy was much different. In fact, there was a lot of across the board. In fact, there was reductions in an in income tax of over 27%. In fact, the information as I put it together here was from the Brookings Institute, but within the state government, there were significant cuts in Medicaid, in funding for higher education for K through 12, as well as funding for um, healthcare, as well as within the elderly and, and services. When, we, when Brookings looked at it as well, there, you could see the reductions as well in state payrolls of over almost two, a little bit over two and a half percent in state payroll jobs were eliminated over in the prior um, recession, recession, as well as reductions of over three percent in local you know, pay, payrolls. You know, what's important is as you look at, at your budget, it's so important to take a look at, at, at different economic drivers and understanding the data, data. 
what I always did when I was working in government is understanding what's impacting my community and what, what are the economic drivers. Um, this slide just kind of gives you an illustration of the types of items I think are useful in monitoring the financial and fiscal health of, my, of our community. You know, performing the quality analysis will, it will be able to provide you insight into, in, into what's occurring within my community. You know, great example, um, A&M, along with one of its partners, Neurodata, worked recently with a Midwest community that went through one of the deadliest tornadoes in U.S. history. And we worked with this community and taking a look at how could they make, make their community an area, a place where people would want to move back to. How could they reinstate the property values? Well, they looked at a combination of data such as household values, property values, crime data, to really take a look at how they could reinvest their capital dollars and their budget dollars to, to help drive that. Well, guess what? Four years later, this community is now seeing the payoff it does. So it's so important that you do have economic forecasting or economic data available that's usable and understandable to aid in policy de decisions. I've got a question here. So my organization is, you know, preparing for financial re re uh, recovery. So are you putting together a roadmap that's going to allow you to, to help address how you're going to increase service delivery or, re um, or affect um, operating revenue? So please answer yes or no here and take a few minutes to answer. So while we're doing that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and continue to, to move on here. So one of the things that, um, that Jake asked me to really talk about is kind of a recovery toolkit. And what we're seeing governments doing to address you know, the funding shortfalls. You know, Glenn Lee really explained, I think, a really good strategy that the city of Houston, I mean, Houston, long you move, the city of Seattle has put together in addressing, you know, its, you know, its sizable general purpose fund revenue. But from my perspective, you know, I look, I'm thinking there's, you know, four, five major areas or response objectives or strategies that governments could take a look at in addressing you know, whether it's the operating shortfall or revenue. You know, the first one is as government leaders, we should take the necessary steps to make sure that the that essential services, that we continue to provide those critical essential services while at the same time realizing the benefits of the short-term funding. You know, what do I mean by that? You know, first of all, understand what the uses, you know, of the stimulus monies are. The U.S. Treasury has a great frequently asked questions uh, checklist that's out there that GFOA has on their fiscal first aid site. I would take a look at that so you understand. You know, secondly, take a look at your costs, just like Glenn is doing in Seattle. He went back and is taking a look at what they spent in various programs and services for fiscal year 18 and 19, and look at those costs and compare them to the service delivery levels and what can my community afford moving forward. From the long-term perspective, the fact that needing to take a look at how services are provided, in fact, the earlier poll question, it said how many individuals thought that revenues or the recession would be ceasing in the near future. And going back to that, you know, the majority um, um, of the group said, you know, within, uh, fiscal year 21, over 50% of those responding, and then about 35% said so it was going to go into 22 or after. That's why, as I present this, I'm saying there's three ways governments need to take a look at that. Immediately, we need to maximize and manage, you know, the stimulus dollars, we need to stabilize our finances, and finally redesign for the future. Yeah. Secondly, you know, is to reinvest. Take a look at how the monies can be used for and the priority for those. You now, the third area is to rethink strategically how your revenues are allocated and your capital structure. You know, in my opinion, COVID's not going away. 
it's going to be here for a while, just as the trends are showing. So as government finance officers, we need to develop models to be able to help, you know, better understand the economic impact. You know, additionally, we need to take a look at our revenues and adjust our revenue base, whether that means increasing new fees, charging uh, different services, or even taking a look at internal service funds. You know, I have it on here, and within GFOA's 12-step fiscal recovery process, it's not the one of the most popular, but maybe governments need to also take a look at, you know, monetizing or selling off underutilized assets. The fourth action is one that I think Glenn has talked about, is, the, is really needing to plan and budget, you know, spending differently and to reinvest, you know, in your program service delivery. You know, guys, the days of incremental budgeting are going to have to go away. We're going to have to start taking a look at doing more program-based budgeting, realigning the dollars on those services that are most essential, and even taking a look at, at those services that are nice to have, maybe defining the service levels. So if those are on further down the list, so the city council and, and, and the taxpayers have a better understanding of what that means as it relates to providing services. You know, finally is, is the last area. And, and thinking back, you know, like Glenn said, he's lived for, through four recessions. I think I have as well. Is the fact that, you know, as leaders, we need to take a look at opportunities to digitize and also automate our services. You know, some of these options weren't even available going back to 2019. So taking a look at how you deliver your services, you know, meaning whether or not that's continuing to the payment of revenues electronically, how you reconcile your bank statements, you know, retrofitting our recreation centers, senior centers, you know, for, for public, um, you know, participation. You know, secondly, I think Rick had this on one of his slides, you know, taking a look at how we do business, you know, automating your RFP processes, automating how you, you know, hire your whole recruitment process. All of that are key areas that, you know, we, I have in my recovery toolkit that is going to require us to take a look at, at, at doing things differently. Um, this next slide is just I'm going to leave with you uh, some strategies that I'm seeing. I'm seeing governments taking a look at improving the collection of revenue, dealing with their age receivables. They're looking at their services, again, defining what's an essential service versus nice, nice to have. They're taking a look at process improvement and in, 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 in taking a look how can they eliminate the bottlenecks, unnecessary added costs, and areas that could be automated. Um, you know, secondly, in this area is also taking a look at, at, at your procurement practices. Is there an opportunity to do more consolidated purchasing to get a bigger bank for the dollar? Then finally, in the last area is, is organization analysis, taking a look at the organization, how you deliver those services, and is there a more optimal way you know, to, for those to be delivered? So kind of in closing, first of all, economic data, the landscape. Definitely use, if you're not doing any type of economic forecast, I would highly recommend it. But make sure that the data you're using is applicable, accessible, and is easily to understand. You know, as you put your toolkit together, make sure it's driving long-term results for both the short term, as well as, in my opinion, over the next 36 months. And then finally, create a balanced approach. I think the City of Seattle case study that Glenn presented is absolutely on track. It's the fact that it's scalable, it's strategic, as well as it's focused on prov providing those quick wins, as well as kind of a long-term resilient, um, you know, forecast. So I appreciate the opportunity here. I think we have a, a minute or so left, so we're going to try to answer some of the questions that that have been posed out there. So. I want to see if I can get back to them. Otherwise, Jake, you may have to help me here to get back to them. Okay. 
Yeah, so uh, folks, if you want to take a moment and uh, ask any questions that you have. All right, so I see G. Karen Reed has a question. Uh, you could go ahead and type it. So maybe as we're, we're typing these in, a question for, for the panelists that I have is, um, you know, looking forward, the, the strategies that, that Glenn has has identified, what additional strategies or, or, you know, financial reductions or operating reductions does the city of Seattle feel that it's going to have to take you know, in order to, to manage this, you know, over the next, you know, 24 to 36 months. I'm all ears for suggestions. I think what you're seeing us do is, in an uneven way, try to move to program budgeting, outcome budgeting, and the demands that have been placed on the city as a result of the uh, social issues that we've faced um, and are facing nationally are really focusing in a way I've never seen before in the public safety environment exactly what outcomes or, or uh, we want as opposed to a complete focus on inputs, number of officers, number of firefighters, and, and so forth. And that's both exciting but um, uh, tough to think about. So I think moving ever more to that way and a bit more of a structured approach than what we're doing um, would be a good good move because if you don't know what you're trying to produce and you you haven't and you want to rearticulate that all the other kind of tactical things or, or technical adjustments are I think not nearly as it's important. Um, thank you, Glenn. I, I, a question that was posed earlier um, has to deal with when. Um, what your thoughts are return to mobility um, as well as air travel for both business um, as well as individual. Um, so Matt or Rick, um, any comments on that? Yeah, hi Nancy, uh, this is Rick. Um, I think there's gonna be a couple of things. I mean, first of all, you have to be able from a business perspective to tell your employees that they're gonna be safe to travel. And so I think until there's clear evidence that getting on a plane or going to another destination is completely safe, um, there's gonna be a lot of recovery that way. Um, the other thing is I think businesses have also discovered is they can save a lot of money by reducing travel of their employees. Um, so I think that's one thing they're gonna take into consideration and I think they've also found that doing this sort of virtual work actually works better than they anticipated. And then the final thing from the business perspective is a lot of the business travel is driven by convention um, and other sorts of professional um, meetings. And until those come back in a large way, um, I don't think you're going to have, you know, a full restoration of any sort of business travel patterns. And unfortunately, that drives a lot of the margin in the industry. Um, so personal travel could come back faster, um, but you simply don't make as much money off of that. So absent business travel coming back, it's going to be harder for the industry to recover. Thanks, Rick. Um, I'd like to pose maybe a last question here. It has to deal with moving into digital services as well as automation. Um, I know personally I probably have, have done more um, online um, ordering of, of restaurant food to ordering of household goods to, to even, you know, payment of my real estate taxes. Uh, do we, do, does the panelists feel that over the next, you know, future that moving to digital government is, is going to be one of the solutions? I do. I think that, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of efficiency 
And um, I think that obviously that's the trend that we're, that direction is what we're moving in. One thing that I, I texted to Rick privately was that as much as I'm all for efficiency, it also worries me from a macro perspective to hear um, uh, local government talk about cutting spending simply because, um, you know, we don't want a demand shock. And so generally we want the opposite uh, in the middle of a recession that uh, we, we want to try everything we can to smooth expenditures. So, but that's, that's kind of a meta comment. That's not really relevant to what you asked, Nancy. To what you asked, I think that it's a great opportunity to become more efficient. So th this is Glenn, and I think it's essential for us for a variety of reasons. And the, the one may be the reality of a lot of our interaction with um, with our constituents. Folks will not want to actually physically come visit us anymore as they have before to handle routine uh, uh, transactions, whether it's buying permit uh, permits for parks or whatever. Um, or paying taxes, and I think uh, I, I know internally we're trying to figure out how to uh, reduce our interaction from a physical point of view with our constituency, and that necessitates from a financial point of view uh, putting all of our payment processes online and very simple to use. So we're actively thinking about how to do that more than we have in the past. Um, thanks, Glenn. So, Jake, I've scrolled through the questions. I think we've covered um, most of them, so I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, yeah, I'd like to just thank everyone for uh, joining the webinar, and um, if you would, please fill out the survey when you uh, leave. And I think that's everything we have for you today, but there should be, uh, this will be part of an ongoing series about economic um, indicator data related things uh, so look forward to another webinar probably in the uh, second or third week of july thank you everyone right now thank you thanks nancy thanks for uh, leading the q a oh you bet <laughs>